Sylvia Jukes Morris, your book, Rage for Fame, The Ascent of Claire Booth Luce. Where did you get the title? Well, you know, sometimes, as with chapter headings, I didn't know what to call a chapter until I'd written it. And one day I was reading Claire's yearbook when she was a child at St. Mary's School in Garden City. And um, she was about 14 years old. And in the yearbook, there was a picture of her. And underneath, she had written, a rage for fame attends both great and small. And I thought, well, that's pretty smart for a 14-year-old. But then I thought, well, maybe she got it from somewhere. So I did some research, and I found it was from an 18th century English poet. It was an ode, and the last two lines were, a rage for fame attends both great and small. Better be damned than not be named at all. And I realized that from a small girl, she had realized she wanted to be famous. So I thought that Rage of Fame is just a perfect title because her whole life after that was um, to that end. <laughs> that picture was taken about 1942, just after she'd been elected to Congress by the famous Canadian uh, photographer, Karsh, Joseph Karsh. She was only about 39. She served in Congress for two terms, four years altogether. I first met her in the uh, fall of 1980 at a house in Washington. But um, it was really a strange meeting because I had already conceived the idea of doing a biography of her. When I, just out of the blue, this invitation came from a hostess in Washington. And I was in New York at the time, and I said, well, it's a long way to come for a dinner party. Who's coming? <laughs> She said, oh, Claire Luce. And I had just had the idea of the biography. So I thought, well, what, should I go and meet this person because I may not like her or I may like her too much? And either way, it's not a good frame of mind to write a biography. You have to be somewhat, um, you have to like, but not to be in love with. And you certainly like have not to hate. But anyway, I went there and um, the hostess said, well, she won't take any notice of you because she's only interested in men. So she sat me at, at her table, and I was across from her, and she sat next to the military historian, actually, Alistair Horne, who's just come out with a new book, I, I see. And uh, she, all the whole evening, she just concentrated on talking to him about, the, about military things, because that was her, one of her loves. But then at the end of the evening, um, I was standing at the top of the staircase where she had to, to leave. And she put her hands on my shoulder, and I thought she'd mistaken me for the hostess because, uh, you know. I... And she said, oh, good night, you sweet thing, and then just swept out. And it was shortly after that that I wrote to her and asked her if I could do the, the book. I was reading um, a file that I keep on people that interest me, and uh, 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 some papers fell out. And it was an article, a New York Times piece, that was written in 1973 when the women, her play, The Women, was revived on Broadway. And it was an extremely good interview with her and made her sound just totally fascinating. And I thought, wow, this is a very... And of course, I'm an English immigrant, so I'm not as familiar with Claire Booth Luce. I wasn't then as, as you are. And I thought this would be a great subject. And. Um, took it from there. Well, she had very little education, as you probably have discovered, and um, she left school at 16 and um, married at 20, a very wealthy Fifth Avenue millionaire, and um, found that he, he drank a lot. They had one child. And after six years of marriage, she was divorced. And then she found herself extremely restless and bored and even depressed went to a psychiatrist for a while, that didn't seem to fix it. So she decided, she met Condé Nast at a dinner party one night and asked him for a job on Vogue or Vanity Fair or one of his magazines. And he said, oh no, you society women, I'll give you a job and then come winter you'll be off to Palm Beach. But she wouldn't take no for an answer, so she simply took herself down to the Grey Bar building where, which housed um, Vogue in those days, found an empty desk and sat down and began to write captions for Vogue articles. At the end of the week, when the payman came round with the paychecks, there wasn't anything for her. So she said, oh, well, you know, when the editor gets back from Europe, she was seeing the, 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 the French collections in Paris. I'm sure I'll be put on the list. So when the editor came back and saw her sitting there, she felt Condé Nast had hired her. And he saw her there, he thought the editor had hired her. <laughs>
<laughs> and that's how she got the job in Vogue. Then she became a feature writer, and uh, right next door to Vogue was the, were the offices of Vanity Fair. And the editor then, editor-in-chief, was a man called Frank Crowninshield, an extremely cultivated Bostonian. And he used to go snooping in the Vogue offices looking for talent for his own magazine, and that's how he'd found Dorothy Parker. And then he quickly sniffed out Claire Luce, and he, Claire Brokaw in those days, and uh, lured her away. And uh, she, she, she started to work for him, and uh, she learned a great deal from her, the then managing editor, a man called Donald Freeman, who was just a little younger than she was. And he fell madly in love with her, but he taught her all he knew, and she began to write stories of her own, as well as doing editing chores. And then when he was killed in a car crash, maybe a suicide over love for her, we're not quite sure, um, she, she became managing editor. So really, she got the job in Vogue late 1930, and, um, Early, sorry, uh, late 1929, and the move to Vanity Fair at the end of that year, and by 19, late 1932, she was managing editor. Then in her usual way, you know, she mastered a job very quickly and then got quickly bored and wanted to move on to something new. She loved to learn. So after a couple of years, um, less actually, about 18 months as managing editor, she took a leave of absence and said she wanted to try her hand at writing plays. So she went south and stayed at a resort you may know called the Cloister in Georgia. And um, Eugene O'Neill lived just along the beach from the hotel. She got herself um, a dinner invitation and um, so stayed down there for about three months writing plays. And then when she went back to New York, still didn't have a finished work, so she took a job as a foreign correspondent on a, not a foreign correspondent, but a a really more of a travel writer with the uh, Hearst and other syndicated newspapers and uh, worked on that for a few months until she met Henry Luce. Henry Luce was the publisher then of Time and Fortune magazines and um, they met at a dinner party and he was extremely rude to her on their first encounter. <laughs> he had a very quick conversation about picture magazines which were still not really a big thing here, but they, they were in Europe, and he was thinking of emulating them. And um, she, while she was at Vanity Fair, had tried to make Vanity Fair into a picture magazine, but Condé Nast had lost a lot of money in the crash, and he didn't have the finances. But she still had the idea that it would be a great thing to do. She talked to Luce about that, and then suddenly he took out his pocket watch, looked at it, and said it was time to go, snapped it shut, and clicked his heels and walked away, and, and just left her standing. But when they met the next time, which was at a birthday party for a Cole Porter, um, it was actually not his birthday. It was the opening night of Anything Goes, I think. It was a celebrate Anything Goes, his new musical that uh, Elsa Maxwell gave this party. Elsa remembered it as being his birthday, but I found that it wasn't. Um, and uh, again, she saw him coming across the room carrying champagne glasses. One was for his wife, and uh, she said, oh, Mr. Lewis is one of those for me. And at that mo moment, the lights went down because the floor show was coming on. And so she said, why don't you sit down? So he sat down, and they talked and talked and talked very intensely. And then he invited her down to the lobby. This was at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And he just admitted that he'd fallen in love. It was a coup de foudre. It was like a stroke of lightning. And that she was now the one woman in his life and that he would call on her next Thursday afternoon. And he was married at the time? He was married with two small children, yes. You talked uh, with uh, the son of Henry Luce, Henry Luce III. Is he still yes. alive? Yes, he's still alive and was most cooperative. And he's now about 71, 72 Has he been old. active in the magazines at all? Yes, he worked on the magazines. He's now on the board um, because he now runs the Henry Luce Foundation. But he headed the London Bureau for a while and... Um, he helped build um, the new Rockefeller Center offices and so on. So. What did he think of his father? Oh, I think he loved him dearly and admired him greatly, but felt um, they weren't close because he was so busy. His father was always so busy and traveling so much. And of course, after the divorce, he stayed with his mother. And he didn't see very much of his father, and, um, which I think was a great pity because uh, he admired him so much. Did he say he was going to marry her? Well, at first he wanted to have a little experiment, that they would see each other quietly 
um, for a year. But he didn't want any scandal because he didn't want to disturb his little menage, you know, he didn't want to, any kind of... And of course he didn't want scandal attached to his magazines either. But Claire didn't want that. And she said, um, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for us. We're both uh, well-known figures in New York society. And we, there's no way we could keep it secret anyway. I think you should go away and take care of your affairs. And meanwhile, I'll go to Europe for several months. And then if you then resolve that you still want to marry, um, then come to me. We're talking now about 1934-35. They actually married at the end of 35. Um, he was not yet quite as powerful as he later became in the, the, in the 50s but certainly was getting that way where what was said in Time magazine was almost more important than what was said in Washington and in the White House even, because the magazine was so widely circulated and widely read and was a real opinion maker. They married in November of 1935 and it was just after the opening of her first Broadway play, which was roundly panned and, and folded very quickly. And it was based vaguely on her first marriage to the alcoholic husband, George Brokaw. Uh, but it was too much of a melodrama. If she had really dealt with it as the semi-tragedy that it was, uh, I think she would have had a powerful play. But she wasn't quite expert enough yet and not quite ready to, I think, expose her own life in, in um, literature, in fiction. How was the marriage between the two viewed in this country? Well, his magazine editors didn't care for it because they were very possessive of him and he'd always been very hard-working and very uh, collegial with them, rolling up his sleeves with them to put the magazines to bed and suddenly he's married to this enchanting woman, brilliant woman, uh, with whom he was totally besotted. And so he would want to take the five o'clock train home to Connecticut every night so he can be with her and take long vacations with her. And at one point, two of his editors took them both out to dinner and said, Harry, you know, you used to be here till 10 o'clock at night on the magazines. Now you want to be home on the 5 o'clock train. There's no way you can run your magazines this way. And she very, uh, who had hoped that they were going to offer her a job in one of the magazines at this dinner party, uh, in tears fled the room saying, um, you know, he could edit all his magazines with one hand tied behind his back. <laughs> and rushed out and then decided she was going to be a playwright. Took herself off to the Greenbrier Hotel in West Virginia and wrote The Women in three days, which was her biggest Broadway hit. The Women was made into a very successful movie uh, by, uh, directed by George Cukor, you know, who was first on Gone with the Wind and many other Philadelphia story, many other hit films. And um, it's still shown on television quite often, that film, and in Art, art movie houses and um, the play has never made her she said at the end of her life less than seven thousand dollars a year ever since she wrote it over 50 years ago when I went with her to London for the 50th anniversary production of the women they put it on at the old Vic theatre and we went there together for the rehearsals before it opening night and one night we were having dinner at Claridge's and after the rehearsal and she said, you know, there are very few plays that are put on after 50 years. And then there was a pause, and she said, well, possibly Shakespeare. <laughs> Total number of years on this project for you? 15 altogether. Because the book turned actually into two volumes, and I have to write a second book now, for which all the work is done. But while she was alive, it was very distracting, because... Um, I traveled a lot with her. I went to Hawaii to stay with her. I looked through her personal papers there. And then after she died, more papers came to light and I had to wait for the will to be probated, for them to be released. It was a very long business. And then they didn't have room at the Library of Congress to house them and they weren't cataloged. And it just dragged on and on. That's why it took so long, really. There she's 20 years old, just married to, about to marry uh, George, George Brokaw. Her, her collection of the Library of Congress turned out to be larger than most presidential collections that the library holds. Because I think, as we said, Rage for Fame, she knew she was going to be famous from, from childhood. And so she kept every scrap of paper that was sent to her and copies of all the letters that she sent out. So um, it's prodigious, this collection. And um, 
at the time, uh, where they first, when it first went to the library, it went there really as a result of a flood. While she was ambassador to Italy, her Richfield, Connecticut house had a flood in the basement where her papers were kept. And her secretary said, you know, we've learned from this, it's not safe because we've lost a few valuable things. So it was then decided that since she'd been a former congresswoman, her papers should go on deposit to the Library of Congress. So the public part of her papers then went there, not including the diplomatic papers, because they were at the State Department. But uh, she kept her personal papers until uh, I came along, and finally she did agree to give those to the library as well. She died in 1987 at the Watergate uh, apartments, where she, where she had actually two or three apartments. She had, she had two apartments that she knocked together for her living quarters. She rented an apartment across the hall for her own personal office, and she had another office there for her secretaries. Did she and Harry Lou stay together for their entire life? Yes, uh, he died uh, m much earlier than she did, of course. He died uh, almost 20 years earlier. Um, and they stayed together even though their marriage, in terms of the physical intimacy of it, came to an end after the first couple of years. He put her on such a pedestal that uh, he um, lost his potency vis-a-vis -vis her after the first two years because um, he just uh, idolized her so much. She was a sort of goddess. How many times did she get elected to Congress? Twice. From where? From Fairfield County, Connecticut. What party? The Republican Party. At that time, of course, it was wartime. And uh, she was a good deal more liberal in her voting than people now give her credit for. You know, she was very pro the GI Bill. She was very pro liberalizing the immigration laws. and. Um, she was much more um, democratic in her way of thinking, democratic party, I mean, in her way of thinking in those days than I think she subsequently became before she became, you know, the great anti-communist that she's now known for and the big fiscal conservative. That After she was a member of Congress, and I know this goes beyond where this book ends in 1942. Yes. What other jobs did she have in politics? Uh, in politics, really none. In diplomacy, yes. She was appointed by Eisenhower as ambassador to Italy, to Rome, um, in 1953. And she was the first woman to have a major diplomatic post of that kind. There had been women ambassadors, but only to minor posts, Luxembourg, Norway, things like that. When was she, did she have any other jobs besides the ambassadorship to uh, Rome? Uh, she always kept up her journalistic career. She was a war correspondent for Life magazine before she went to Congress. And then she always kept her hand in at writing political columns for the rest of her life, actually. When was she the she best known in the United States? When? When? Why, when she was ambassador, I think. She was, I think, the most admired woman in America next to Eleanor Roosevelt. And the most admired in the world, I think, next to Eleanor and the Queen of England. How, how many days of her life did you spend with her, do you think? How many days of her life? Did you spend with oh, her? Oh, well, in terms of years, I met, in, I met her in 1980. She died in 87. So for those seven years, we were together very, very often, particularly after she moved back to Washington, after she sold the house in Hawaii in about 84. Would you see her every day, every week? Oh, every week at least, yes. Yes, and I then, would go over. She would come to my house for dinner. I would go to her house. We went together. We spent time in one summer in Newport. We traveled to Canada, London. We were extremely close. In fact, we were getting too close at one point, and I had to sort of step back a little because I was in danger of losing my objectivity, I think. Um, you know, when you know so much about someone that you can complete their sentences, she'd say, oh, that year, was the year I went to London and I stayed at the... And I would say, oh, the Victoria Hotel. Yes, the Victoria Hotel. <laughs> um, I got to know more than she could remember herself a lot at the time because I had researched her more recently. And um, at the end, when we were at Claridge's and that same trip to London, we were having dinner, she suddenly out of the blue asked me um, who I felt closest to. And before I could reply, she said, uh, because I feel closest to you because you know everything. Yes, I, had, I liked her a lot, and I admired her very much. She had this incredible sense of humor, that no matter, you know, sometimes she would be a bit of a monologist <laughs> at dinner parties, she'd get a little boring with her political views. But she was so funny, 
that whatever she did, you know, she had this redeeming humor. Um, Dr. Rosenbluth, like many men the, on first meeting her, were thoroughly enchanted by her. She was, and that's very hard for me too, because I only knew her as an old woman, so I had to struggle constantly to imagine what the impact was of this glorious creature, who not only was stunning looking, but also of superior intelligence and charm and wit. So men were totally taken with her, and the doctor that she consulted in the early 30s was no exception. And he too was married with young children, and there was no question, I think, of divorce. But um, he did love her, I think, till the day he died. But there was no affair, not to my knowledge. Randolph Churchill was a, sh a small fling. He was much younger than she was. They met when she went to stay one weekend at his father's country house in Kent, when um, she was then having an affair with the financier Bernard Baruch, and he called her in Paris and said, Mr. Churchill invites you to join us for the weekend. And the person who met her at the, air, at the station was Randolph Churchill. And he then was about 22 years old and like an Adonis. He was a, a stunning <laughs> man. And also of a romantic turn of mind as she was. And uh, there's one funny story. Do we have time for it? Um, when I was in Hawaii researching the book, her personal papers with her, she had invited my husband to come too. And he said, well, I can't come because I have to work on my volume two, two of Theodore Roosevelt. So she said, well, I'll give you a room to work in. You won't be disturbed. So he said, all right. So he came. But turned out that that house was right on the ocean. And all the, the doors were louver doors, and all the windows were slatted. So even though he was in his own little room, when we were in the library and the winds were blowing through and all the windows were open, he could hear us talking. And one day she came in and started to tell me about that weekend at, at Churchill's country house. When uh, she went to bed that night, uh, she was just on the point of falling asleep when her bedroom door opened and somebody came in in the dark and she heard them crossing the room and they tripped over the coal scuttle <laughs> and she put on the light quickly and she said well it was Bernard Baruch and I was expecting Randolph yes uh, the Bernard Baruch affair as such didn't go on the light the friendship was lifelong until he died in his 90s they were always friends Bernard Baruch was a so-called speculator he's a man who knew Wall Street who became something of an advisor on economics to presidents, Presidents Wilson and uh, President Roosevelt and Hoover and various others. But she fell in love with him because he was much older. She'd, she'd lost her father when she was very young, so he was something of a father figure as well as a mentor. He taught her about politics and economics. And also he was not obtainable. So anybody who was not obtainable for Claire became the one uh, that w was most desired. So although they had a small fling in the, in the early 30s, it didn't go on for very long because he was so much older than she was. And he was married and he had grown children and he was not in love with her either. He said to a friend, a mutual friend who passed the word on, that although he was fond of Claire, his heart was not involved. Joseph Kennedy. So, so that was devastating to her. I think there's no actual documentary uh, evidence of an affair, but since he had so many with other women, and she did, in one of her diary entries, in, in, um, when she was staying in a Paris hotel once, say that he was in her room all morning, and she kept meeting him on transatlantic crossings when she was alone without Harry. And she saw him in Rome and in London many, many times when Harry wasn't there. I think that it's probably correct to say that there was something of a, a short fling. Her daughter was um, not actually a debutante, but she came out at the time that John Kennedy was making the rounds, you know, escorting young ladies about New York, and in fact took out her daughter on several occasions. But uh, Anne always got the feeling that her beaux were really more interested in her mother, who was just had so much more charm and was better looking too. So Charles was General Charles Willoughby, who was intelligence chief to General Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines.
And Claire was always interested in military men, and particularly if they had anything to do with spying. And since he was the intelligence chief, she was incredibly drawn to him. He was also rather taciturn, the strong, silent type, and tall and striking looking. And she said to me that he was the one man that um, she might have liked to run away with. But it turned out that Willoughby never came back after the end of the war. He elected to go to Japan to bring democracy to the Japanese with, with MacArthur. They met when she went as a correspondent for life to the Philippines. She was married to Harry at the time. This was in the early 40s, before she became congresswoman. She met him with Harry on her first visit after coming back from China. They stopped off in the Philippines. That's when they met. And then she got an assignment from life to go back. And that's where the affair really got underway. And then it was an affair mainly by mail until he came back stateside to report on something to the, the administration during the war in the mid-40s. And they saw each other a couple of times only. And it was so it was mainly an affair by mail. David Sarnoff was not a consummated affair, I don't think. It was just some, 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 he expressed a little interest, made a little pass at her. Who at was he? Point. Well, he was then, of course, the head of RCA. And how did they meet? And uh, they met when um, Baruch took her uh, to his apartment one night, where David Sarnoff was going to show an early experiment in television. So she was one of the first people to see one of the first televisions. And so television. someone she was having an affair with, Bernard Baruch, took her to another man who got interested in her. And did, did he let her know that? Sarnoff? Yes. Oh, I think he took her home and probably made a pass, you know, but it didn't go very far. I don't think it was an affair. Condé Nast, according to another character in the book called Mark Sullivan, who's a historian, columnist, he said that Nast was in love with, her, with Claire. And Claire said that, in fact, Nast wanted to divorce his wife and marry her. But she was not interested in Condé Nast. She what was not it? attracted to him at all. What was, who was Condé Nast? Uh, Condé Nast, of course, owned Vogue, Vanity Fair, and House and Garden magazines. And he was her boss, of course, at both those magazines, Vogue and Vanity Fair. And she saw him frequently and socialized with him a lot. And he was madly attracted to her, but she, she just simply wasn't attracted to, to him. What about it? Was there a pass made by his wife, uh, Yes, Leslie? his wife was apparently sapphic. And uh, she went both ways. And she did make a, a pass at Claire, yeah. Bill Gaston was the husband of a woman who is probably not remembered too well now, but was well known at the time because she starred in one of the most successful theatrical extravaganzas of all time, a play called The Miracle which was um, directed by the um, Austrian producer, Max Reinhardt. And this miracle went on tour for six or seven years in Europe and America. And the two stars of it were a woman called Rosamund Pinchot and a woman called Lady Diana Cooper. And Claire always said that she was offered the part that eventually went to Diana Cooper in that play. And the other part went to Rosamund Pinchot, whose husband, Bill Gaston, was a tremendous womanizer. And Claire rented his house on, <laughs> guess what, Crotch Island. <laughs> and he kept coming and going, and he wouldn't let her, he wouldn't let her uh, have any peace. You said in that summer on Crotch Island there were a lot of affairs, a lot of different men. A lot of different men. How did you find all this out, by the way? I find, well, she kept a diary of that summer. so. It was all documented that first of all came William Harlan Hale, one of her young recruits on the magazine, who was going to be one of those young promising writers of the early 30s who knew Catherine Ann Porter and had written. Claire in 1932 was 29, and he was about 22 years old. And he was the first arrival on Crotch Island. They all stayed f four or five days. And um, then when he left, Mark Sullivan, the much older man who was more Baruch's age came to stay. I don't think that was necessarily a consummated relationship, but certainly not for want of um, trying on his part. And then came a, a young major in the army, a young um, man called Kerry Skerritt. And then, of course, Bill Gaston was in and out because it was his house that she'd rented. 
And when she got back to town, of course, it was Bernard Baruch and her mentor at Vanity Fair, Donald Freeman, who was the man who taught her everything about writing. She was actually much more interested in talking about Harry's peccadilloes than about her own. But some of them she would admit to, and the major ones were Baruch and, of course, Harry and Hale and General Willoughby. Those were the, th the major ones. I think the others she thought were just trivial relationships, nothing serious. Did anybody know about all these back in those days? It's amazing to me that her name was always out of the scandal sheet. She never had a breath of scandal really attached to her name. I think privately people were rather scathing of her, particularly the men who were jealous of her at Time Inc., the edit some of the editors. But on the whole, Claire was um, not a name that got into the papers except to do with her work. She became a celebrity because she was such an achiever. Playwright, Foreign reporter, reporter. Yes. congresswoman. Novelist too. She wrote, she wrote a series of short stories which read like a novel, but they're actually interrelated stories called Stuffed Shirts. That was her first published book. She wrote a serious work of history about the phony war called Europe in the Spring. And she wrote three big Broadway hits, every single one a hit and every one made into a movie, which was The Women was, Came First, then one called Kiss the Boys Goodbye, 1938, and then in 1939, a play called Margin for Error, which had Otto Preminger playing a Nazi consul who was protected by a Jewish New York policeman. At the end of her life, she was lonely, extremely lonely, because, you know, if you 84 years old, a lot of your close friends have died already. And um, she had difficulty concentrating, too. And also, she'd achieved so much, I think, she'd proved so much, that it was hard for her to just churn out articles, even though she was capable of it. She gave speeches almost to the end, still was getting five, ten thousand dollars per speech. She was extremely fond of Bill Buckley. In fact, she adored him. They had a very nice correspondence, and occasionally she would write for his magazine, National Review. And she went on Firing Line, his program on, on public television. She always kept up her um, friends in the intelligence community and in, in the military. And uh, she had uh, close women friends in Newport, Chicago, New York. And they're not names that you particularly know. They weren't well known except uh, in society. And um, she had a variety of friends and she liked young people too. She, w she befriended uh, Henry Luce's grandchildren, would take them on her travels and um, encourage them in their enterprises. <laughs> well, it's ironic because she had a brain tumor. And my husband used to joke with her because quite often she'd have these little ailments and we'd be there when the doctor would come and he'd test her wrist, you know, take her pulse, tap her stomach and everything. And then he'd say, well, can't find anything. And she would look at the ceiling and say, well, I think that after I die, they'll say there was absolutely nothing wrong with her. And Edmund used to tease her, said, when you die, he said, they'll have to beat your brains to death with a stick because she was so sharp always, so quick. And then she got this brain tumor, and of course he felt terrible that he'd said that. Mercifully, it was quick. She was diagnosed about February of 1987, and she died in October. Were you there when she died? No, because she wasn't up really to seeing anyone at the end. And I didn't really want to, because I wanted to keep that, you know, I had to write about her alive, and it was terribly painful to, for me to see her like that. I was, um, I was at the last dinner party that she gave, which was in July. Who was there? Quite a lot of Washington news people, Charles Krauthammer, Morton Kondraki, Pat Buchanan was there and their wives. And um, Henry Luce the third was there, her, her stepson, my husband, myself, just a small group, a couple of tables. When I picked up the phone and the secretary said Sylvia Clare died last night, um, I had that feeling you sometimes have, uh, in, in your heart goes like thud in your heart. It was a real thud. And then um, 
although I rushed over to the apartment straight away and was at all the funeral services and went, went down to the burial, which was on her southern plantation in South Carolina, which is now a Trappist monastery. She's buried there under the great live oaks by the Cooper River. I found afterwards, the next three months or so, I kept dreaming about her a lot. I had strange dreams, and one was particularly weird because it was her, she was like a stripper in a vaudeville show, wearing a bright blue, it was a technicolor dream, which I think is strange because I think most people dream in black and white. Um, it was a blue spangled dress. And although she actually didn't take off her clothes, I knew it was, they were, were kicking their legs and so on, it was a strip show. But it was an old Claire, it was an old face with a sort of blonde wig and very long black eyelashes and a deep gash of a red mouth. And I realized that what this dream symbolized probably was that in a way I was going to expose Claire in my writings. I was going to write about her most intimate life. And it was very troubling probably in my, street, in my sleep. And I find that I was grieving and the grieving wouldn't end. It just went on and on. For several months I dreamt about her constantly. And I suppose it was because I loved her, you know. I'd come to love her, even though I tried to distance myself from her. What do you think she would really think of your book? I asked myself that because on a trip once, I went with her once on uh, Bill Casey, remember, the head of the FBI? Was it FBI or CIA? CIA. Yeah, they looked up CIA, yes. We went to, to the, um, he, he was to make the Winston Churchill, Fulton, Missouri speech, you know, at Westminster College. And she asked me to go because she was going to introduce him. So we were on this little propeller plane there. And uh, she was talking about my book in the plane. And uh, oh, she said, oh, I'm going to leave you this in my will. And I said, you can't leave me anything in your will. Oh, why not? She said, let the chips fall where they may. I said, because it wouldn't be appropriate. You know, it would look like a bribe. So she knew she let me see absolutely every scrap of paper. And I think she took comfort in the fact that I did know her at the end and I knew everything about her and that I liked her in spite of everything you know and some of the things she did were as anybody who gets on in life they have to do pretty ruthless things and pretty inconsiderate and selfish things but nevertheless um, I think she would admire the fact that um, I, I laid it all out there in an honest and fair way and I tried to be balanced and um, it's not hagiography at the same time, it's not um, one of these hatchet jobs either. What does hagiography mean? The study of saints. And she knew she was no saint. <laughs> By the way, did she leave you any money in her will? No. <laughs> no did, she, did she die a wealthy woman? What she left, actually, was she left her tapes and records to my husband. <laughs> because he, um, there was one thing about Claire, she was very competitive with everyone and she was always better at everything than everyone. She was a great athlete, she was a great golfer, she could shoot, she could swim, she could hunt, she could ride and she was always better at it than everybody else. But the only thing she was not good at, and it's ironic because her father was a musician, was music. She was tone deaf. She couldn't carry a tune at all. But in old age, she started to listen to records. And she accumulated quite a collection of records. And she would listen to them in her room when she was trying to get to sleep because she was a terrible insomniac. And I think in the end it was a gesture toward my husband, you know, that she had tried to master the thing that he is good at because he wanted to be a concert pianist. I don't know whether you know that. But Edmund never knew whether he wanted to be a writer or a pianist. So it was her little way of saying at the end to Edmund, I did come to appreciate your feel too. <laughs> Where did you meet Edmund Morse? We met in London. Um, I actually had been in America for a couple of years, traveling, working, going to Mexico, the West Coast, and then I would get back to New York, find I had no money left, so I'd have to stay a little longer. And in that time, I didn't know it, but I kind of became an American. So when I went back to London, thinking of our family in England, and I was going home, I realized as soon as I set foot off the plane that I'd become an American and I wasn't going to settle there. But I forced myself to stay. I took a job teaching in London and I took, I rented a room in a little house. 
And Edmund um, was in advertising then. He worked in advertising. And he used to, in exchange for being able to play this lady's piano every lunchtime so he could practice, he agreed to do some light household chores for this lady. And I was renting a room in this house, and one night I met him. I was in the kitchen making my dinner. What year was this? And this is, uh, oh, dear, 1964? Uh, uh, no, early five, early 65 about February. And um, he came in to do some of his chores, and that's how we met. And he didn't look too well. And he had a paper bag, and I said, what's that? And he said, oh, that's my dinner. And I said, what is it? And I looked inside the bag, and it was um, one of those lion tea rooms they have in England. It was um, an apple pie. <laughs> and I said, you're eating this for dinner? Oh, yes, he said, I have some coffee, and uh, I'll make some coffee on it, instant coffee. I said, why don't you sit down? I'll make you an omelette. I made him an omelet. And I had this chock full of nuts coffee that friends used to send me from America, you know, the ground coffee in cans, and made him a cup. Oh, he loved this coffee. And about a um, year and some months later, we were married in London. And he'd always wanted to go to America as an ad man. He thought he was going to be a swinging ad man in those days. And uh, I said, well, I'm going back as soon as I can raise the fare. So literally, we came back together with a suitcase between us and came back to New York. and and got jobs there and started over. What year did you get married? 66. What year did I you came move? back in 68. You know, we had a little condominium just along the street, because when we were coming to Washington to work on our books, we kept staying in hotels, and it was very expensive. And I remember one week we spent $1,100 just on one week of working at the Library of Congress. And Edmund said, you know, we're not going to ever have any equity if we keep doing this. So when I got the advance on my book, uh, we put a small part of that down on a down payment on this condominium and we used to walk past this house on the same street and have little fantasies about it because it was our favorite house on the hill and said oh wouldn't that be nice to live there and then when Edmund got the Reagan book the, the book on Ronald Reagan he um, we were in New York one day and a big hurricane came it was 1985 and a friend of ours was staying in a hotel, and she called up, she said, I can't get on the shuttle. Can you put me up? So she came along to our apartment and stayed the night. While there, she said, oh, by the way, they're selling that house that you like. So I knew the owners, so I called up, and I said, we're very interested. And the owner said, well, when you come back to Washington, come over and see it. We went in, and she had a party going on at the time. She said, oh, go take a look. So we walked through, got to the top floor, and the sun was setting behind the dome of the Capitol. And Evelyn said, I'm a goner. I have to have this. <laughs> so we, we bought it. This was 1980. We moved in, in in January 1986. And Edmund began the Reagan book in uh, the fall of 85. Well, together we wrote a book for Reader's Digest, which was called uh, Great Events That Changed the World. It was about 30 chapters about the great explorers from the Vikings to the moonshot. And we divided it between us. He did Pissarro, I did Columbus, you know. I did the moon exploration and he did the Vikings and so on. And then uh, we found that writing these chapters, which were about three and a half thousand words each, we liked to go into things in greater depth. So that's how we drifted into biography. And my first book was, came about because Edmunds, Edmund wrote a screenplay once um, about Theodore Roosevelt's Days Out West, which he called The Dude from New York. And somebody saw an article he wrote about North Dakota, which helped pay the trip out there when he was researching the screenplay. He wrote a new, for the New York Times an article on North Dakota. And somebody uh, gave him a contract for a book. It was supposed to be a short, popular biography about Theodore Roosevelt. But after he'd been writing for four years, they realized he had a three-volume life here. And so that was just volume one. And while I was helping him type that manuscript, I said, who's this lady that he eventually married, who was his second wife, Edith? And so nothing's known about her. So I said, well, she intrigues me. So I went to the library, I did a bit of research. There wasn't much known about her. And um, so I wrote a proposal, and a publisher was interested in it. So I got a contract straight away, and I wrote the book on Edith Roosevelt, which took her right until her death. And of course, Edmund's book ended uh, when T.R. became president. Both of you have the same publisher? 
At that time, it was uh, Coward McCann, which was a subsidiary of Putnam. But now? But now, we're both at Random House. Both the same publisher, both writers, mm -hmm. living and working at the same time in the same house. Yes. What, what do you think of this life? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a nice life, but it's an insecure life. <laughs> In the sense that uh, you you are only as, as secure as the, as the project you're working on, you know, and you never know whether it's going to do well or not. It's a big gamble, and that's what, fortunately we don't have any children because I think it would be just too precarious a life. Who's Pauline that you dedicate the book to? Pauline is my sister, and at the time I was just finishing the book, uh, she was sick. And uh, I just felt very close to her at that point. And since I de dedicated the last book to Edmund, I, and I only have one sibling, I dedicated it to her. And how's your sister now? How is she now? She's fine. She lives on a farm in Shropshire. She's married to a farmer. She has two sons. And you've got a second volume of this book coming out after 1942. When is it due? It's due in a couple of years. And I should write that much more quickly because uh, I have all the research done for that. You talk a lot in the book about Claire Booth Luce's mother. Yes. Who was she? Fascinating lady. She was the kind of character who, whenever she came onto the page, she kind of took over. I had a terrible struggle keeping her off the page when she came on it, because she was such a character. She was a lady born on the Lower West Side to a laboring butcher. He was a, a Bavarian immigrant who became a butcher. He never moved out of the laboring classes. He later became a livery stable keeper. And she was a gorgeously beautiful, dark, chestnut-haired woman with violet eyes. And she wanted out of the ghetto when she saw that her brother and sister both died of ghetto diseases, meningitis, tuberculosis, that kind of thing. And she lived a short walk away from Broadway, and she used to hang around the wine bars there. And one day she met this very dynamic man who was more than twice her age, William Franklin Booth, a man who was actually married at the time. And they began an affair. She was 18 years old. He was in his 40s, late 30s, early 40s. And um, she became pregnant and gave birth to David Booth, Claire's brother, in 1902, and Claire was born the following year, and they were still not married. I don't think they ever married, because he didn't get a divorce until 1907, when Claire was four years old. And I never found any papers, any marriage certificates. And I went to Memphis, Nashville, Chicago, New York, everywhere they lived, found no evidence of a certificate. And he couldn't in any case have married in, remarried in New York State because in those days you could not marry if you were the guilty party in a divorce action, which he was. And in any case, by the time he was free to marry, the marriage was really on the rocks. The, the relationship was on the rocks. And shortly afterwards, Claire's mother left him and returned east, leaving him in Chicago, and um, put out to her children the fact that he had died. And Claire grew up thinking that her father was dead. And Claire Booth Luce's mother died how and when? She died in an accident. She was in Miami. She used to go to Miami every winter with her boyfriend, a man who financed Claire's education, such as it was, Joel Jacobs was his name, and he was an extremely wealthy man, millionaire, and he owned the uh, Firestone, a uh, Keystone, sorry, a uh, Keystone um, tire company. And she wouldn't marry him because in those days there was a lot of snobbery about marrying somebody Jewish in the circles in which Claire's mother now moved. And she, she wanted her children to um, be raised in the Episcopal faith. And um, she married, eventually, a doctor from Greenwich, Connecticut. But the little man from the tire company still kept coming around. He was much older than she was. And every winter, they went off to Florida together because they both liked the races. They liked gambling. 
and they were on their way back from the races one day when she was driving the car and couldn't stop, it seems, at a, ra at a, ra at a railway crossing. It seemed to go right past stationary cars onto the tracks. The train was coming quite slowly, actually 40 miles an hour, hit her and she was thrown from the car. Her leg was, her foot was severed, her one ankle at the ankle, and um, she was thrown and killed almost instantly. 55 years old. Yes. This picture was taken uh, by the very famous uh, photographer called Horst in November 1941. And it was taken by actually on a Vogue shoot. That gown she's wearing is by the famous designer Valentina. You remember whose husband went off with Greta Garbo? And she's wearing jewels by Verdura. And the gown and the jewels were brought out for the shoot by Vogue. And uh, the scene is her house in Connecticut. And the feature article was about the house, actually, not about Claire. And this picture actually never ran in the article. Another one ran where she's sitting more upright. But I thought that the outstretched hand went very much with my subtitle, The Ascent of Claire Bethlehem, because it says, I have arrived. And it was Claire at the height of her beauty and the height of her fame and, and accomplished just before she was elected to Congress. Thank you, Mr. Lamb.